Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the Book of Luke. Very, very interesting series. And we've come to the final lesson in that series, lesson number 13. And this lesson is for June 27 of 2015. And you could guess that if we're talking about the Book of Luke, we're now talking about the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This will be a very interesting lesson, I'm sure. Uh, I hope you have your Bible handy in front of you, or read, fairly readily anyway, and we're going to ask you to bow your heads with us as we ask the Holy, Holy Spirit to guide us in our discussion. Our wonderful Father, it's with a great deal of humility and appreciation that we bow before you in light of what we have in this lesson. Help us to learn these important lessons more clearly and more succinctly than we have before so that we can speak about it to others with conviction. We want to thank you for coming and living and dying to accomplish what could not be accomplished in any other way, our salvation. Help us to understand it more clearly because of our time together today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I would like to suggest that this lesson covers the two most important events in human history, the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. Those sound like pretty important events. Yes. We've talked about his childhood. We've talked about his birth. We've talked about his ministry, quite a few aspects of his ministry. Now we're coming to the end. Jesus knew, apparently, from very early in his, in, in his life, that he had come specifically to do what? To die. Are you all uh, looking forward to the day of your death? Not really? <laughs> well, how do you suppose that would impact you to know that you had come here specifically to die? Luke points this out by, in many passages, there's a bunch of them, and, and Matthew and Mark have some as well. I'm, you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. He did not allow anything deter, de, to deter him from that awful fate. When Peter tried to reprimand him for talking about his future death, what did he say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Wow. Well, last week we talked about the fact that this argument, this, this challenge, began right in the Garden of Eden. And what did God say? If you sin, you will die. What did Satan say? That's a lie. There it is, right there in Genesis 2 and 3. Well, in the Garden of... Well, we know what happened. Uh, Eve, in the Garden, um, ate the forbidden fruit. And all of us thus became part of the, the sinful family. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus made it possible for us to escape that terrible association with Satan by offering proof of the truth of his word spoken back in Eden. In the Garden of Eden, Satan tempted, to eat, tempted Eve to selfishly taste the forbidden fruit. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus lovingly sacrificed himself to taste death for all of us. Gethsemane is the ultimate example of self-sacrificing love and obedience to God's command. Can, can yeah. you say, we discussed last week that <clears throat> when, Jesus, when Jesus came, there were, he had some goals, and those goals uh, were not necessarily realized. Um, so, in regards to his death, had he been let's say, ultimately successful in his mission here. Mm -hmm. And if all the Jews had been converted and all that's that. That's right, yeah, okay. yeah. And, and, you know, people, with, the world had really seen what it was all about and, and we we'll use the term converted. Mm -hmm. But he had to, had to do this dying business. Yes, and people have talked about that before. I don't know with how much authority, but 
it has been suggested that he would have been sacrificed as Isaac was by Abraham on the altar, except that he would have actually died. So why, why would he have to go ahead and die? Everybody sees because what he's... Because the argument started back in heaven, and those questions had still not been answered. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, well, all of that happened quite a bit before, well, a while before sin in Eden, yes. before we took part. Mm -hmm. And this, or his life experience on this earth and his death was to bring peace to the beings in the heavenly places as well as the beings on this earth. And then 1 Corinthians 4 and 9, this earth is a teaching place, is a theater stage for the onlooking mm -hmm. universe. So he accomplished his work uh, uh, swimmingly. I mean, it, just, it was a great demonstration that God is righteous because God had been accused of not being righteous, mm -hmm. that God was arbitrary and vengeful, etc. Well, one of the main characters that plays out in this final week and weekend of Jesus' life was Judas. <coughs> did, did Jesus, now, I, I will have to say honestly that I take a little um, exception to something, some of the things that are spoken of in the, in the Bible study guide. Did Jesus actually choose Judas? Didn't, no, but he didn't Judas ask to be? Judas asked to be. Look, look at a couple of places. Look at, at Luke 6, 12 to 16. At that time, Jesus went up the hill to pray and spent the whole night there praying to God. What's he discussing? Which disciples are going to choose? When day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them. Now, that talks about choosing, whom he named apostles, and he goes all down. And the last one is Judas Iscariot, who became the traitor. Okay? So that would seem to suggest that maybe he did. Ellen White in the book Desire of Ages, page 293 said, Judas urged his way into the group and Jesus actually tried to discourage him by saying, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of God has nowhere to lay his head. Would that be a discouragement to someone like Judas? Not enough. Not enough, no. Well, um, Did you suppose that night in prayer was, to a large extent, deciding what to do with uh, this guy Judas that's going to want to be, that wants to be part of the cho inner circle? That must have been part of the discussion. Well, the other disciples, what did they think of Judas? He's great. Yeah. Must they, have. They thought he, he had a lot of potential. Maybe another Paul. Ellen White finally says in Desire of Ages, page 716, paragraph 3, he had fostered the evil spirit of avarice until it became the ruling motive of his life. The love of mammon, of course that's money, overbalanced his love for Christ. And when Jesus fed the 5,000 men, not counting women and children, with five loaves and two fish, Judas recognized almost immediately the political and military advantage of that power. And think about it. You go with a huge army, you're going to travel with that army over to conquer Rome. How are you going to feed them? Simple, right? If anybody gets injured, what do you do? Wave your hand and they're well, right? I mean, he had it all figured out, right? Well, he set on foot the project to take Christ by force and make him king. Desire of Ages 719. When Jesus demanded that the disciples get into a boat and cross the Sea of Galilee and leave him behind, Judas's high hopes were dashed and his disappointment was bitter. And from that point on, he separated himself a little bit from Jesus. He says, I, I know better what this guy ought to do than he does. Try to imagine that. Judas refused to take his eyes off the temporal dream that he had and thus lost his place in a future kingdom which would be beyond his wildest dreams. When Mary poured that expensive perfume on Jesus' feet, read that in John 12, 1 to 8, Judas was the first to denounce the waste. And why was he anxious to denounce the waste? He kept the money. Yes. He kept the money bag. He thought, man. And apparently took from it liberally for his Very enemies. often. It was from that meal that he went out and sealed the agreement with the Sanhedrin to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, a working man's 
wages for a month. At that point, Satan entered Judas and he became a lost soul. Luke 22, 3. How many of us have our eyes fixed on earthly treasure more than on a place in the kingdom of God? Have you thought about that? How has the cross of Christ and his death impacted you personally? Well, I mean, we know that his life and his death were, are the great divide in human history. There's obviously the B.C. and the A.C. <coughs> A.D. thing, but he's also the divider between faith and unbelief, between betrayal and acceptance, between life and death. Everyone must eventually choose which side to be on. You, you can't sit on the fence forever. You have to choose Jesus or Satan. Could that example also with Judas be um, a message that the, no matter how close you are, there's someone that can fil infiltrate, there, that we still have to constantly be watching for ourselves regardless of of who we have around us, even those that we think we can trust. Yeah. Let's talk about another group, the Sanhedrin. What do we know about the Sanhedrin? There were 70 men. They were Pharisees and Sadducees. They were the ruling council of the Jews. What else do we know about them? It had to be at least 30 to be a member. It had to be 30 to be a member. It was led by the high priest, and, and they were all pretty much wealthy. Pretty had to be wealthy. Yeah. Yeah. They were terribly afraid that the rising influence of Jesus and his power over the people was going to take the power and influence away from them. So they decided, at the suggestion of Caiaphas, who was the chief priest at that time, that it was better for an innocent man to die rather than to risk their loss of influence and power with the people. And what happened? They lost it anyway. And what about Pilate? How does he relate to Jesus? Well, he, he basically sized him up to be an innocent man from the beginning. Almost immediately. Yeah. And he had his wife's dream as a warning, didn't he? Mm -hmm. So what did he try to do to get himself off the hook? Send him to somebody else. He tried to send him to, to Herod. And what did Herod say? If you perform a miracle, yeah. I'll, I'll set you free. I'll get, get you out of this. So, I mean, Jesus had performed many, many, many miracles, hundreds of them. And here, he, he brought in the sick and the... So here, people who needed miracles. Why didn't Jesus just, why didn't Jesus just do it? I didn't think that was a difficult question. <laughs> Jesus set himself as a part of his mission to this earth not to do anything for his own benefit that we couldn't do. So this would be a case of doing something to get himself out of trouble, and he refused to do it. Wow. Well, what about the two thieves? What do we know about the two thieves? Well, Ken, uh, Jesus could do miraculous things for other people, mm -hmm. and so could the disciples. Yes. And it is very reasonable to assume that his disciples today could do those kinds of things. Yeah, possibly. So now where am I going with this question? So, so you said, <laughs> you said Jesus determined not to do anything for himself that we couldn't do for ourselves. So if we could heal other people, <clears throat> Why couldn't we do that for ourselves? Well, I mean, basically, that's a good question. The idea is, do we do things for selfish reasons or do we do things for loving reasons? Well, Guess whose kingdom selfishness it represents and whose kingdom love, love represents? Well, but if I was a, if I was a, a significant factor in, in bringing people to to meet the master, mm -hmm. and I got sick or something, wouldn't it be 
uh, a very selfless act to heal myself so that I could continue to help these people. If it's the right thing to do, God will do it for you. You don't have to try to do it for yourself. Well, but I mean, but then if I'm not doing it for myself, then if God doesn't need me to do it for myself, then why does he need me to do it for other people? This is a well, that's, that's hard question, I know, but I'm just know, trying no, to figure I, it out. I, I, yeah, I think it's a fair question. What God is trying to say is, as Christians representing Jesus Christ, we reach out for the healing of the nations. That's part of the outreach of Jesus Christ. We don't do it for ourselves. I mean, you know. And of course, how, we, how, we, don't, how, we don't do those things in our own power to begin with. Yeah, exactly. It's God's leading that sure. permits us. That, that. Well, the two thieves, let's come back to the two thieves. One of them on each side of him crucified. And one said, heal yourself, get yourself out of here and get us with you. And what did the other one say? Well, after he started out railing along with the other one, he said, no, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Why the difference? What's the difference between two, these two guys? One Any idea? obviously knew something about Jesus. The guy who, who said that had actually been a follower of Jesus and interested, and you can read about this in Desire of Ages, page 749, had had, had followed Jesus and really was interested in him. And then he, he, he came to the conclusion, you know, if the scribes and the Pharisees say this guy is wrong, how could they possibly, how could they possibly be wrong? They, he, he must be some kind of a hoax or some, something wrong with him. And he turned away from Jesus, fell into the wrong company, got into crimes and ended up being crucified. And all of a sudden he realized he's about to be crucified with this same guy and he watched him. He watched him through the trial. He watched him through all this. And he realized, no, this isn't, this isn't just any ordinary human being. This guy is really what he claimed to be from the beginning. Well, hanging there on the cross, yeah. Jesus wasn't cursing and swearing no. and doing no. anything. He just kept his mouth shut and let him uh, abuse him. So. I have thought from time to time, Ken, you know, there was a time when uh, James and John um, were bucking to be on the right and the left hand side of God and Jesus says you don't know what you're asking for. <laughs> right. <laughs> I have wondered if if that's really wasn't what he was thinking about was yeah. that that cross coming well, up. A couple of weeks ago we talked about that issue. <clears throat> How many of the disciples do you think well, they've been anxious to follow Jesus that they knew were, they were signing up to be itinerant preachers for the rest of their life and end up being martyrs. And think of what they what they thought they were signing up for compared to what they actually were signing up for. Well, I think it's the same thing today when people make that choice to follow Jesus. They, mm -hmm. they don't really know <laughs> what, what all that can involve. Okay, what happened on Sunday morning of, of, of crucifixion weekend? The women came to the grave. The women came. It was still dark. And they came, and they came from different directions. They didn't want to... I mean, I think probably Mary came from Bethany and the others probably came from the upper room and whatever. They came from different directions and they came to the tomb and... The tomb was empty. It was empty. The stone had been rolled away. Yeah. And what did they do? They left and went back and told the others. Yeah. Um, After the angels talked to them. Yeah. yeah. The angels said, he's not here, he's risen. I so guess their first reaction would have been terrible disappointment, and they came to... Yeah. What did they do with him, right? Yeah. That would have been their re exactly. first response. That must have been. Yeah. What did they do with him? Did they think that Jesus is not even worthy to lie in, the, in a rich man's tomb? So nobody was there when this happened. Well, I guess the guards. The guards would have been the ones who relayed this story to, to, uh, to where the where the. Uh, they got out of there as fast as they could. Right, I know. But I was. But they were the only humans yeah. that were there. So it's, it's this story we have available to us because they were there and relayed it to. Um, well, and, or and also because God may have revealed it to. Mm -hmm. 
his disciples. Well, stepping back for a moment, if Jesus had failed to come forth from the grave, how would that change the story? I would say totally. Totally. <laughs> well, the specific, well, it's, it's, hard, it's hard, to, hard to guess what the specifics would be. Yeah. Totally, that's an easy answer. Yeah. The specifics. Well, think about it. If he rose in his own power to prove that he was divine, then if he, if he couldn't rise in his own power, that would, he would not be divine. Right. If he was not divine, then whatever he was, we don't have the answers about God. We, we, we don't have the answers in the great controversy. And he couldn't save us, so there would be no plan of salvation. That's a pretty serious situation, right? Well, mankind by now, if, long before now, would have probably killed them, uh, the whole creation yeah. off. When the, when the women arrived in the upper room, they probably had a knock and knock before someone finally put the door open just a little bit to see, make sure it was the right people. What happened? Did they all start rejoicing? They weren't didn't, believed. Didn't, didn't believe it. These men Why were so... Why would you believe women? Yeah, exactly. They were so culturally prejudiced against women, as, they, as, as we know they were, and they were totally depressed and discouraged because of the events that had happened on Friday, and they're hiding from the authorities over the weekend. They absolutely could not believe the women, except two of them. Two did what? Two of them did what? Ran to the tomb. Peter and John ran to the tomb. And what do they find? Just what they said. Same exactly thing. what the woman had said. What a surprise! <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, there's a, there's more to the story than 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 just these human events we've been talking about. Um, instead of going back to heaven quickly and celebrating like they were hoping it would do, Jesus spent some time walking a dusty trail some seven miles to Emmaus. And what happened during those seven miles? Now these were a couple of the lesser known disciples. People had been following Jesus for a long time, but not, not among the, the 12 or the 11. And why was that? Why, why weren't they? Why, why wasn't it uh, one of the James or John well, or? Probably because th their home was at Emmaus, and so these guys were just going home. Why, why didn't Jesus come and share this in this way to Peter? Yeah. He did, finally. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Well, I, I, I think Jesus saw them, and he thought, he thought this as a marvelous opportunity. And what happened on that, in that discussion? Their well, you know that opened. their eyes finally got opened. I, I'm going to read you a passage, a very significant passage from the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, which is a, the forerunner of Desire of Ages, he, that is Jesus, maintained his disguise. What does that mean? He didn't let them know who he was, right? Till he had interpreted the scriptures and had led them to an intelligent faith in his life, his character, his mission onto earth, and his death and resurrection. He wished the truth to take firm root in their minds, not because it was supported by his personal testimony, but because the typical law and the prophets of the Old Testament, agreeing with the facts of his life and death, presented unquestionable evidence of that truth. So now let's stop, let's stop right there for a moment. What would have happened if Jesus had showed up, they're just starting on the road to Emmaus, they're just headed down the path, leaving Jerusalem, and Jesus says, here I am. What do you think the way they would have done? All discussion would be ended. All discussion would be ended. They would race back to the upper room, right? So why was it important they had this concept? That's what I wanted to ask you. <laughs> well, I beat you to it. <laughs> you make us much. use our, our brains to think. Now he says process. he wanted them to recognize, he wanted to go through all, the, all the way through the Old Testament and say, look at this verse, look at this idea, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. See how this fits with my life and my death. And so when they arrived back at the upper room, they weren't just, guess what, we saw Jesus, but you know what, look at what he taught us. 
Was that for the angels' benefit also at that point? I hope so. So where is the recording of the text that Jesus used? Boy, I wish Which I had gospel there. is that in? Not there. But what we do have is this. What we do have is this. That basically pattern is a pattern that virtually every one of the, the apostles and the disciples used from then on as they preached the gospel. And I wonder if they didn't get the suggestions and the key texts from those two men. Now that's, is that a hypothesis or is that? Uh, that's a hypothesis. Uh, okay. And here's another hypothesis. Perhaps um, the text of, of that presentation is not available because um, it would be preferred if we went back and, and researched it ourselves. Now there's an odd the thought, isn't there? Isaiah, Isaiah 53 sure has yeah. a lot by parallel to what we've been studying here yeah. all, so far. Well, is it possible that Jesus didn't really die? You know, there are people who claim that if in fact he was alive on Sunday, it is because he didn't really die. Such a claim, of course, to a believing Christian is preposterous. Think about it. Having been beaten to within a breath of his life, brutalized, crucified, eventually pierced with a spear, there's no way he could have staggered out of a rock tomb. I don't know how he would have gotten it open to start out with. Snuck past the Roman guards and then walked the seven miles to Emmaus as if nothing had happened. <laughs> Think of how preposterous that whole idea is. When the two lesser-known disciples returned to Jerusalem to report their exciting news, they found that Jesus had appeared to the others also. Imagine the Son of God using Scripture to prove his case. Wasn't his personal presence enough? But he disguised himself. He disguised himself. How good are we at proving our Christianity from the Bible? Do we spend a significant amount of time studying it? What kind of impact has it had on our, on our daily lives? I would like to turn our attention a little ways away from what our Bible study guide does, like to read some passages from Ellen White. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. Fallen men could not have a home in the paradise of God without the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now that's what we've been talking about. Shall we not then exalt the cross of Christ? The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. Angels? It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. Now you asked me earlier, Jesus, or suggested, could Jesus have failed? Angelic perfection failed in heaven. Human perfection failed in Eden, the paradise of bliss. All who wish for security in earth or heaven must look to the Lamb of God. That's SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, five The Ellen D. White Comments, page 1132, paragraph 8. It is hard for us as egocentric human beings to accept the fact that the security of the universe was even more important than the salvation of human beings. I'm going to read something unbelievable almost. It was in order that, and again, this is from Ellen White, this is from a not quoted place, The Signs of the Times, July 12, 1889. It was in order that the heavenly universe might see the conditions of the covenant of redemption that Christ bore the penalty on behalf of the human race. It's because of what? The heavenly universe. The throne of justice, that would be God's throne, must be eternally and forever made secure even though the race be wiped out and another creation populate the earth. Who is he talking about? He's talking about human beings. He says, even if God lost every single one of us, he must prove his case in the, in, in the great controversy. Amazing. How, how would that be possible? If he lost us all, how would he be proving his case? Well, he could still prove that Satan was lying and that he was telling the truth. 
That's the key in question. In that, it would be obvious that uh, the effects of sin uh, um, are deadly, yeah. among other things. Well, he already had in heaven, he had uh, mm -hmm. Enoch and Elijah and Moses, so part of the human race was already yeah. taken care of there. Christ alone could restore honor to God's government. The cross of Calvary would be looked upon by the unfallen worlds, by the fallen race, and every mouth would be stopped. In other words, you suggested the words, okay? Here's how words serve God's purpose. Who witnessed these scenes, the, the scene of, the, of Calvary, the heavenly universe, God the Father, Satan and his angels? How many human beings watched the crucifixion and death of Jesus and understood what it was all about? None. Zero at that point. Do you have any questions about the death and resurrection of Jesus? Are there any doubts in your mind as you consider that incredible story? If so, you've got lots of company. But there's a considerable amount of compelling evidence to suggest that the story is absolutely true. For example, Jesus said to his disciples, let's just take one example, Jesus said to his disciples, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, he said that to what group? Disciples. A few disciples who, a couple days later, were discouraged, hiding, afraid for their own lives in the upper room. And the idea that these few disciples would somehow carry the gospel to the entire world just seems preposterous. And then what about this thought? Christ died for sinless angels too. And I'm just going to read, and I would like to encourage anybody who has questions about this to get our, our handout, because it's uh, quite extensive. Um, it's available at our website, theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G on the internet. You can look for the Sabbath School class for uh, June 27 of 2015. I'm just going to read the highlighted portions of these passages. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angelic perfection failed in heaven, and we read that in our previous passage. Did the angels really need the message of the cross? Ephesians 1, 7 to 10, Ephesians 3, 7 to 10, and Colossians 1, 19 and 20 say that, yes, we need it. In fact, just, just let me read just one of those passages, one from Colossians. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. In other words, God is not taking anything away from the fact that Jesus was indeed fully God. Through the Son, then, he decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his Son's blood, and his Son's blood, what does that imply? What's that talking about? His life. It says on the cross, through his Son's blood on the cross, he's talking about his death on the cross, and so brought back to himself all things both on earth and in heaven. How, how does the death of Jesus on the cross help the unfallen worlds? Well, look at this. This, this, is, this is almost shocking. For centuries, God looked with patience and forbearance upon the cruel treatment given to his ambassadors, had his holy law prostrate, despised, and trampled underfoot. He swept away the inhabitants of the Noachian world with a flood. But when the earth was again peopled, men drew away from God, and renewed their hostility to him, manifesting bold defiance. Those whom God rescued from Egyptian bondage followed in the footsteps of those who had preceded them. Cause was followed by effect. The earth was being corrupted. A crisis had arrived in the government of God. Not here on planet earth, in the government of God. All heaven was prepared at the word of God to move to the help of his elect. One word from him and the bolts of heaven would have fallen upon the earth, filling it with fire and flame. In other words, what were the, what were the angels expecting to have happen? Destroy those people. Yeah. Destroy those wicked people. If, if there's a few that are, that are faithful, save them and get rid of the rest of them, right? He died at once, right, in the flood? 
So at that point then the angel still did not understand God's character. That's right. Amazing, huh? It, that is amazing. <laughs> God had but to speak and there would have been thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes and destruction. The heavenly intelligences were prepared for a fearful manifestation of almighty power. Every move was watched with intense anxiety. The exercise of justice was expected. The angels looked for God to punish <clears throat> the inhabitants of the earth. The heavenly universe was amazed at God's patience and love to save fallen humanity, the Son of Man, took humanity upon himself. This is a pretty potent theology here. Yes. To have all the other creatures on the other in the rest of the universe and to have angels who there's every reason to believe it, have lived millennia in the presence mm -hmm. of God, creatures which he'd created from eons in the past yes. to not take, it takes this kind of a lesson for them to figure out what God is really like. That's, that's a, for a lot of people it, that would be pretty, pretty hard theological pill to swallow. I, it's in the Bible, it's in Ellen White. I, what, what can I say? Let me read you another one. It's not the only one. For centuries, God bore with the inhabitants of the old world, but at last, guilt reached its limit. He came out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth, and by a flood, cleanse the earth of its iniquity. Notwithstanding this terrible lesson, men had no sooner begun to multiply once more than rebellion and vice became widespread. Satan seemed to have taken control of the world. Does it seem like that at all today? The time came that a change must be made, or the image of God would be wholly obliterated from the hearts of the beings he had created. What's that talking about? How could the image of God be completely obliterated from the hearts of, of men and women? Well, you've got to look around us today. It's well underway. Well, I think it ain't a lot of pagan concepts. Yeah. If it can be obliterated in the heart of one, it can be obliterated in the heart of all. And who's busy trying to accomplish that task? Satan. Satan, yeah. Satan and all his angels, that's exactly what they want. What they would like to see happen, they would like to see God abandon this earth to them. Just go away, God. Leave, leave, leave us this earth. We, we asked, and I guess I asked the question of how could these eternal well, I guess close to eternal beings have such a misconception. And when I ask that, I'm asking, how can they be so much? Like us, maybe. Well, I guess what I'm really asking, the question I'm going to follow that up with is, are they really all as, as intelligent and as smart and as magnificent as we make them out to be? Maybe, maybe we are the most magnificent thing when it's said we're the crowning act of creation, maybe maybe we, well, uh, we could talk about potent theology here, but maybe maybe uh, maybe we're not only the crowning act on this planet, but maybe we are the crowning act in the universe, which is you, you, you're overlooking one important fact. <clears throat> Good. We, <laughs> have, we have in in front of us all of this evidence spelled out in detail: Scripture, the writings of Ellen White the history of our world. They had none of that. But they, they were, were they communicating were, directly with God. They could communicate they directly could communicate with God. Directly with God. Why, do they, why do they have to happen? Why can't they? Why could there this be such a puzzle? Yeah. Well, all heaven watched the movements of God with intense interest. Would he once more manifest his wrath? Now the flood is gone now, past. Would he destroy the world by fire? That's what they thought. The angels thought that the time had come, this would be maybe somewhere in the book of Judges, right? The angels thought that the time had come to strike the blow of justice when lo, to their wondering vision, was unveiled the plan of salvation. That's manuscript 22, 1890 from Ellen White's diary. Before Christ's first advent, I'm reading another one. Before Christ's first advent, 
the sin of refusing to conform to God's law had become widespread. Apparently, Satan's power was growing, his warfare against heaven was becoming more and more determined. A crisis had been reached. A crisis in the government of God. I mean, that <laughs> blows me away. With intense interest, God's movements were watched by the heavenly angels. Would he come forth from his place to punish the inhabitants of the world for their iniquity? Would he send fire or flood to destroy them? Well, all heaven waited, the bidding of their commander to pour out the vials of wrath upon a rebellious world. They were ready. Give us permission, God, we'll zap those sinners. One word from him, one sign, and the world would have been destroyed. The world's unfallen would have said, Amen. Thou art righteous, O God, because thou hast exterminated rebellion. That's Signs of the Times, August 27, 1902, paragraph 4. What made the difference then when God did it at the time of, of Noah and, and in the past versus this time? Why was there a difference? Well, we have suggested before here that he had to do it at the time of the flood because corruption and, and wickedness was spreading so fast, if he had waited another generation, there wouldn't have been anybody listening to him. So the well, flood... We're close to that right now. Yeah. So the flood was a rescue mission. Yeah. Rescue this little clump, this little family mm -hmm. that has a small... A tenuous connection uh, with yeah, heaven. A very so tenuous connection with heaven. The purpose was different. Yeah, it, wasn't it was not destroying the wicked to rescue, but rather rescuing those yes. yeah. from that. And not everybody who got on the ark was a saint. None of them were. <laughs> I didn't go quite that far. <coughs> I did. <laughs> Depends on how you define saint. Yes. So then, if we follow that through, will the end of time then be a rescue mission also? In a sense, yes. It will be. God will say, here's a small group of people who are so committed to me that no matter what Satan does to them, he will not be able to get them to, to turn. Who will, who, will, who will take my side, who will worship me, who will do my will, because they love me for no other reason. They may go through the worst possible situations like Job, but they will say, so help me. You know, as Job said, though, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. You know, that's the kind of people he's looking for, and he's looking for a group of them. And the world is going to be just totally blown away by that. We're going to be put on trial. We're going to be up before judges. We're going to be interviewed by all the TV stations and so forth. They're going to say, what's with you people? how much time do we spend thinking about the significance of the final events in the life of Jesus here on this earth? Has it changed us? A number of other major religions in the world celebrate their leaders by visiting their graves. As Christians, all we have is an empty tomb. Thankfully. What does that tell us? How did the cross, which was an instrument of shame, designed by the Roman government to thwart any attempts at treason, become a symbol of salvation. What do you think you would have done if you had been in the upper room, one of those early disciples of Jesus, on that weekend, on that Friday? I'd like to think I would have done what I should have done, or should do, today, but <laughs> the paradigm was mm -hmm. of the time. You know, the, the other question is, having all this evidence, all this information, all of this story, would I be any different? Well, I guess we'll watch you and see. You now have it. <laughs> that bothers me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. Well, let's turn to Jesus himself now. How would it impact to you to know that the physical pain that Jesus was going through was hardly felt because of his fear of being separated from his Father, even for a short time, as a result of sin? Can you grasp the fact that Jesus won a victory 
for you. And what would it mean to take up the cross and follow Jesus in the 21st century? I've often wondered what it meant when, in his early ministry, Jesus was already talking about taking up a cross. It turns out, I just found out about this recently, when Jesus was approximately the age of 11, there was a huge rebellion led by someone who thought he could, you know, get the Jews to rally behind him and get rid of the Romans, one of the zealots. And the small town of Sepphoris, which was very close to Nazareth and probably a place where Jesus did a lot of his carpentry work, that town was completely wiped out. And as a, as, a, as a warning to the people of Galilee, they took all those people that they killed in, in, in Sepphoris and put them on crosses all the way down the roads in every direction. Something like two or 3,000 went there. I yeah. mean, it was a garrison town. Yeah. yeah. What, 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 how would you feel if you had to go to work every day walking through that? Well, our Bible study guide says these words. See what you think. The most sublime truth in the world is that Jesus, holy and sinless, came to this world, suffered and died for our sins, and rose again on the third day, victorious over Satan, sin, and death. And the next most sublime truth is this. He offers this victory over sin and a place in his kingdom for all who accept him in faith. What does that mean to you? It's sobering when you think about it. Sobering. Definitely. It, it could be interpreted as being a narrow view of why Christ died, why Jesus mm -hmm. died. Ignoring all that we have read and discussed in the last several minutes about Jesus' death being for the whole mm -hmm. sinless universe. Yeah. This doesn't necessarily say that they're ignoring that, but it implies. What does it mean when you say that Jesus died for sinless angels. I mean, don't we believe that he paid the price of sin? Yeah. So what would it mean to say he died for sinless angels? To teach them. Teach them what? God always does the right thing. If, mm -hmm. uh, it, Jesus says, I'll teach you how to pray, our mm -hmm. Father who art in heaven. That implies that there's a parent-child relationship between God and his kids. Mm -hmm. And his kids have to be taught. Mm -hmm. They aren't born with all knowledge. They have to learn. Mm -hmm. even, even the sinless ones. And they have, even the sinless ones, because they heard the lies on the part of the adversary. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a third of them were convinced by those lies. Yes. And mm -hmm. the other two thirds heard the, heard the, uh, the charges, argument. but they have to, it took until that time that the evidence was such that it settled it in their minds. In other words, they weren't sure until this point that God was the one telling the truth and Satan was lying. Apparently so. They weren't sure that sin leads to separation, which leads to separation from God, which leads to death. They didn't Let, realize let's, that. Let's just look at that verse again. We've, we've looked at it previously at different times, but let's just look at it again. What does Isaiah 59 verse 2 tell us? It is because of your sins that he doesn't hear you. It is your sins that separate you from God when you try to worship him. What does that mean? Your sins do what? Separate you. Separate you from God. And what's the only source of life? God. The creator. Infinite one. Some people have had questions about that. Maybe we should look at one of those verses really quickly. Look at Acts 17. Start with verse 25. Uh, well, let's look and start with verse 24. God who made the world and everything in it is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples made by human hands. Now, this is, G this is Paul making a speech where? Just across, just, just below the Acropolis, in, in, uh, and the, in the uh, Parthenon in, in, in Athens, okay? Nor does he need anything that we can supply by working for him, since it is he himself who gives life 
and breath and everything else to everyone. So if you say someone gives life and breath, what does that mean? Well, I think there's a, a significant statement there where it says, as though he needed anything. Yeah. The infinite does, is in need of nothing. Yeah. If he, was, if he needed something, he ain't God. Well, now let's think about that for a moment. Did Job do anything for God? Absolutely. Something he couldn't do for himself, maybe? Job well, demonstrated uh, uh, for the benefit of the onlooking universe yeah. that, uh, that uh, God, in his foreknowledge, declared Job as righteous. Yeah. And Job demonstrated that he was righteous uh, over that story of the book of Job. But uh, let, let me read this other verse here, then, then I'm going to comment about what Jim just said. Verse 28 in that same chapter, Acts 17, As someone has said, in him we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. Yeah. Uh, aren't we kind of saying here that it was necessary for sin to become manifest so that all of God's creation could see his true nature? That, that's, that's a, are, are we kind of saying that? that we are. We are saying that. That's what the Bible says. Well, boy, oh boy, that's a... <laughs> when I said God doesn't need, any, need anything, He doesn't need sacrifices. Yeah. He doesn't need praise and people holding their hands up and dancing around and all kinds of stupid things. He just needs human beings that trust Him and will demonstrate that God him. can be trusted. Yeah, and love Him and care yeah, about Him. That's... Yeah. Well, the Gospel of Luke that we have studied this quarter was written to one of, of Luke's friends named Theophilus. What does Theophilus mean? Do you remember? Lover of God. Lover of God. Friend of God. Could we, could we be qualified as Theophiluses? How do you think he responded to this book when he first received it? This is a Greek now. He has not been to Palestine as far as, there's no evidence he ever was to Palestine. He, he receives this book. And Luke says, and he, what did Luke call it? He called it an orderly account. <coughs> what, do you, what do you suppose Theophilus thought as he, as he read this book for the first time? Did the orderliness of the account help him to realize that it might be really true? I think it, it would appear that Luke was aware that Theophilus either needed or wanted this information. Mm -hmm. Um, well, we all so therefore, we? therefore, Theophilus, I would think, would have, you know, he must have had some idea of, of these stories. Maybe, so, maybe his question was, Luke, what in the world happened to you? You used to be here making a profitable business as a doctor in, in, in Troas, and all of a sudden you just <clears throat> are gone. What happened? Is that possible? We don't know where he came from. Well, many Christians have questions about the creation story. But they look forward to the day when all the righteous will be recreated and given heavenly bodies to dwell with Jesus forever. However, if you do not believe that God created man in the beginning, isn't it foolish to believe that he will recreate all the resurrected righteous at the second coming? I mean, he's not just going to create one or two at the beginning. He's going to create a whole bunch of people all at the same time. More questions. In summary, let us look at three key moments, key moments that took place that weekend. In the Garden of Gethsemane, after struggling to the point where he was sweating drops of blood, Jesus finally said, Father, if it is your will. Christ's greatest fear, both in Gethsemane and on Calvary, was that his separation from the, from the Father might be eternal. Read that in Desire of Ages 686, paragraph 5, and 750, paragraph 2. So, when we voluntarily choose to sin and separate ourselves from God, do we feel a terrible loss and a great terror because of that separation? Separation from the Father, who is the only source of life, brings death. We've already read Isaiah 59, verse 2. By taking upon himself the separation that results from death, Jesus died. 
Jesus' death was a demonstration to us of the truth that sin leads to death, the truth that he had warned us about in the Garden of Eden. So what about that bitter cup that Jesus had to drink? When Jesus prayed that the cup, or my, cup might pass from him, it was a legitimate prayer. Prayer may be reasonable. It may be legitimate, but it also must be submissive. God, your will be done. Remember Romans 8, 28, which in the King James says, all things work together for good. No, that's not what the Greek says. The Greek says, in all things, God works for good. We can count on that. The moment of victory came when Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. Jesus had relied upon the evidence heretofore given him of his Father's love and acceptance. Desire of Ages 756, paragraph 3. By demonstrating the truthfulness of his words and showing the awful consequences of what it means to be separated from the source of life, God opens to us the privilege of accepting his offer of returning to him and becoming his friends. Remember Romans 5.10, and now we talk about, well, let's just read that. I think we've got a moment here. 2 Corinthians 5.19. Our message is that God was making the whole human race his friends through Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins, and he has given us the message which tells us how he makes them his friends. Those who experience the new life in Christ discover that that life does not begin with birth, it begins with death. Only when self dies can we rise in newness of life. That is why baptism is the best symbol of the new birth. What was accomplished by the cross, the, go the gospel writers did not talk much about it, but Paul talks about it in great detail and all the references are there. Can we know with certainty that the events that we have studied in this lesson are real? What is the relationship between the resurrection of Jesus Christ and our future hope of salvation? Can you name some of the passages from the Old Testament that Jesus might have used to convince the two men on the road to Emmaus? Why are the contents of that conversation recorded in Acts conversation that it recorded not given to us. Speaking to the shell-shocked disciples and others in the upper room, what evidence did Jesus provide that he was real? They saw him, they heard him, they touched him, they saw him eat food. What a transformation, what an incredible, incredible experience. Think about what happened between that Thursday night and that Sunday night. Would you like to be a part of that rejoicing group that will someday shout hallelujah in heaven? Our kind and wonderful Father, we know that the things we've talked about today are quite alien to many people's thinking. We ask that our discussion might have challenged them to relook at what they believe about these things and to come closer to you by going through that experience is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.